welcome to class. We'll get started for today. Hope you guys had a great weekend. So, last time we were getting us started into chapter five. Before we continue with a couple questions, one I want to uh, announce today, my office hours are going to be canceled. I'll be back Wednesday as regular, 1.30 to 3.30 are my Wednesday office hours. If you have any questions, concerns, you could try to come up after class if that's helpful. Shoot me an email um, if you have some questions, maybe if you're hoping to attend today. Um, and I'll try to take care of any questions you have by email. Um, if you want to try to set up a meeting or whatever, if you were planning to drop by, just shoot me an email. We'll try to set something up. But um, I wanted to talk a little bit today about Top Hat real quick and uh, mastering sort of to review the point system for these uh, um, tasks. So in Top Hat, we've asked about 48 content questions so far and also 11 sort of survey questions that weren't directly related to the content. This means that the maximum score that you need to earn is 48 points. And you're earning, like I mentioned before, 1.25 points per question, including 1.25 points for the survey questions. So this means that you've had the opportunity to earn 73.25 points, and you only need that 48 for the actual perfect score. Now, whenever you look at your grade in Top Hat, it's just going to show you the percentage of the 73.25 that you've earned. I have to go through at the end of the semester, download a spreadsheet, do some arithmetic on it to actually calculate your true score. But your true score, you can calculate it just by taking however many points that you have earned and then divide by 48. And then just cap it at 100. Um, and so the, uh, um, the, the idea here is we're just setting the stage for 100% is just gaining um, about 70% of the answers question correctly here in class. Maybe you missed a lecture or two. Um, you can see that missing a few questions here and there, missing a lecture or two is not going to have a devastating or even a negative impact on your grade. You can still easily end up with a 100% score. Um, and if I had to take a guess, there's probably 95% of the class who have earned at least 48 points. You know, and there's really a, only a small percentage of the class who miss most lectures. I, I mentioned this before, if you do have to miss class because you're sick, but you're, you're like well enough that you can follow the lecture notes from home, you can actually open up Top Hat from home and still log in and see the questions as they're, they're coming up. Um, I think it's better to come to class, of course, but if you're sick or if you're on the road, if you're traveling, if you're on an athletic team or something and this is useful to you, at least you have that option available. More so you can keep up with the material than necessarily getting the points, because I think you can see here that you can withstand missing a few points and end up with that perfect score. Uh, mastering, just to give you an update on mastering, it's uh, 97 points of what you need to have earned uh, through tonight's homework set for a perfect score. Um, we had all those dynamic study modules, those uh, chemistry topics that were available before midterm one. If you've done some of those, it's possible you've gone above 100%. Even some of the homeworks have a small bonus if you answer some weird like hint or something, I think you get a small bonus. Or, and there's some way where on some of the assignments you can actually earn above 100% by like a tiny little bit. So you may have over 100% on your homework, but again, the maximum score is 100%. The key here is you can earn some credit back on your homework score if you've lost any points through those dynamic study modules. Their main due dates are before the midterm. So the next set of due dates is Tuesday before uh, midterm two. There's another batch before midterm three. And there's a batch a little bit earlier for the final, but we'll talk about that when we get closer about how there's a date we need all of our points in for mastering at the end of the semester. So last thing I'll say today is you can look your score up on uh, Carmen. I did something funny yesterday that I quickly undid. So you may have seen your score change briefly yesterday. Don't worry about that if you did. I was trying to come up with a way for Carmen to show you this arithmetic that I've shown here of taking 5%. That's the value of recitations. The value of top hats, 5%. The value of the homework, 7.5%. Labs are 20%. And all the exams together are 62.5% of your grade. The way Carmen's doing it right now is they're just taking midterm 1 times 10%. 10%. So all the weights are properly in Carmen, but it's just like discounting midterm two, three, and the final. And Carmen is just doing this math times like 10%, and then dividing by however many percentage points have been asked. So like the grade in Carmen is possibly inflating your grade a little bit because it's not truly weighting your midterm one score versus all the exam points. If you calculate your grade this way, in particular if your score midterm one wasn't hot, this is gonna show you a number you probably don't wanna see, but it's just a reminder that that's where uh, your grade would be heading if you get the same score in midterm two, three, and the final. It's just a reminder of like how we need to do good on exams more than we need to do good on these things. 
So like you could get a great homework score, that's fine, but we really need to get good get great exam scores to get a good grade in the class because that's where 62.5% of the points are earned in the course. So just kind of a reminder of how you might check your grade um, if you wanted to see this kind of information today, but also to get some reassurance that if you are missing a couple questions in lecture, not to stress about it. Um, so first question for today, let me see where we're at. Told your ACL is dissolving in the water, the solution temperature is rising. We're trying to figure out this exothermic or endothermic in the sign of delta H. Let me give you guys about a minute and a half. If you want to check your answer, compare some notes with your neighbor. If you just came in, give this problem to an attempt. <coughs> Okay, um, it is the 53% the group is the right answer. So let's take a look at this one and see where we veered off. There is an easy misconception here, and it's easy to get lost in the temperature. Remember how we said before, you can never really track the temperature of the reaction. You know, the reaction is just HCl and water were there, now it's HCl dissolved ions. So it's kind of hard to even like imagine touching what used to be there compared to what is there now. The only thing you can really be in contact with is the surroundings. The surroundings of this reaction is the solution it's taking place in, the container of the reaction. If everything touching the reaction is increasing in temperature, that means that the surroundings heat, the surroundings heat's increasing. And we might remember that our Q reaction is the negative of the Q of the surroundings. So if the surroundings are gaining heat, then it must mean that the reaction's losing heat. The reaction's giving heat off. That heat given off from the reaction is being absorbed by the solution, allowing it to increase in temperature. So think of your reaction, perhaps your A goes to B, as A is up on top in terms of enthalpy. We're losing enthalpy down to B. And that doesn't make the temperature drop. That makes the temperature increase, because the reaction's losing energy. So the energy lost is being given to the surroundings. Okay, so the reaction loses heat. Um, that's the meaning of an exothermic reaction. So if delta H is negative, implies that the reaction lost heat. And then that implies that our Q reaction, um, so delta H is equal to the Q of our reaction. Sometimes you write QP, sometimes I like to write Q reaction. It's just the heat change of the chemical reaction that's occurring. And that that heat change is negative. So the reaction's losing heat, the surroundings gaining the heat for this type of reaction. Okay, so if we had the opposite, if we had an endothermic reaction taking place, an endothermic reaction has to absorb heat to occur. The heat of the reaction is going up, but that heat has to come from somewhere. That heat would come from the surroundings. So if you find that the temperature of the surroundings is dropping, as the temperature is going down, then that implies that you have the endothermic reaction in the case where the reaction is absorbing heat. <laughs> So we have to kind of remember that if a reaction absorbs heat, it's taking it from the surroundings. So if you touch the reaction, you feel your heat going away, you feel cold. Likewise, if the reaction is giving heat off, you get the heat, you feel the heat, you feel it in the case of the temperature going up, in the case of it feeling warmer. Okay, let's get this problem here and maybe come back to um, a discussion of 
Open versus closed systems, we were talking about this a little bit last time. So uh, an open system, we found that the delta H is equal to Q. For a closed system, it could have a change in work take place due to like a pressure volume change. And then for uh, like a closed chemical system, we were finding that the work would be ne somewhat negligible if there was a change in work during the reaction. But if we have the case where gas is being absorbed or given off by a reaction, we can sort of look at that gas and sort of have that be our guiding um, sort of light to see if the gas is being given off from a reaction. It's like pushing into the walls of the container. If you have a gas being given off, then that's a reaction working on the container. That's like the reaction heating up the surroundings. So that would have a <coughs> negative W associated with it. If you have a gas being absorbed into a reaction, then that would have the opposite effect. That would be the, the sort of surroundings working on the reaction, working on the system, and have the positive sign of W. Kind of like the same sign if the surroundings were heating up the reaction fuel or giving their heat to the reaction to increase its enthalpy. So just kind of trying to show us the sort of how we might think of the sign of W compared to Q, how it kind of follows the same one If the reaction gives heat, gives work, both of them have a negative sign. If the reaction accepts heat, absorbs heat, absorbs work, absorbs gas inward, then both of those signs would be positive. So consider the reaction taking place here. Um, see if you can write it out and figure out which of those two cases is going on here. Okay, so let's take a look here. So for, for W, we got W right. On, so the, the two big groups, 43%, 35%, was getting the sign of W correct, that the, that the work is being done by the surroundings onto the reaction because the gas is being absorbed inward. Because our gas is being consumed in the reaction, then that's the surroundings working on this system. So the sign of W would be positive for this reaction. And then still coming down to the temperature of the solution increasing, the surroundings of the reaction are increasing in their heat because the reaction is giving the heat off. 
So the reaction's losing heat. So we're looking for the sign of Q and W for the chemical reaction that's occurring. It's accepting work from the gas of being absorbed inward. So W is positive, but then it's warming up the surroundings because the reaction's losing heat as the reaction occurs. So this is an exothermic reaction um, giving heat off just like an uh, exothermic combustion reaction gives off a flame. If we touch it, it's, we're going to feel definitely like a very hot flame. Probably don't want to do that. Um, likewise, here we see that heat being given off because this reaction is also exothermic. OK, now let's look at actual quantities here. Of, you know, like Let's look at a reaction where we have a given delta H. We were talking about this at the end of class last time, how our delta H is relating the quantities of reactants. We have two moles of hydrogen peroxide decomposing to water and O2. So we have two moles of hydrogen peroxide decomposing to form two moles of water and a mole of O2 gas has a delta H of minus 196 kJs. So we're talking about how if you flip the reaction, you flip the sign of delta H. It, so that's just the first law of thermodynamics. So if you have water and oxygen combining to form H2O2, you got to flip the sign of delta H. If you double the quantities, you'd have to double the magnitude of delta H. So if we had like 4H2O2 forming four waters and two O2s, the delta H would be minus 196 times 2. So we can manipulate delta H. Then we can also perhaps understand, well, how much heat would be given off if we just had five grams? If I had two moles of H2O2 decompose, 196 kJs would be given off. But we only have five grams. So see if you can figure out how much heat's given off if only five grams decomposes. Oh, and then also maybe verify if heat's being released or absorbed by this reaction. So think about that question as well. I'll give you guys a few minutes on this one.
see. OK, that's the right answer. OK, so here's how we might think of this problem here. Here's the way I would probably think about showing the work here. I would probably think of it this way. Let's almost like thinking of like two steps. So let me solve for what the heat change is for the reaction. Almost I don't have to think too much about the sign yet of what it means. So I might just calculate my Q reaction because what I know when I'm told that this reaction decomposes at constant pressure, that constant pressure is just the lingo that I know that this delta H corresponds to the Q um, change of the reaction. Um, sorry, not, not minus. It should be still that the heat change, the delta H of the reaction at constant pressure is just equal to QP. And QP is just heat change at constant pressure. And so I often think of that as Q reaction. So the heat change of the reaction is just given by delta H when the reaction is occurring at constant pressure. And remember we said before, even if you close this reaction in and have a closed container, then they're just approximately equal at that point. And they're very similar to each other. It's only when you have a piston being driven uh, that the delta H and Q have a much different meaning, more for mechanical systems than ever for, say, just a true chemical system. But so the, the point is, calculating Q reaction is just based off of delta H. So I'm taking my five grams of the um, H2O2. I'm going to convert it over to moles because my delta H relates to the moles of H2O2. So we'll convert over to moles. So that'd be 34.02 um, grams per mole of H2O2. And then from my reaction, this is where I need the two moles. So the two moles of H2O2, when two moles reacts, the Q reaction is minus 196 kJs. And so by calculating Q reaction, I'm just keeping whatever the sign is, and then I'll think later about what it being positive versus negative means. So I do that in two steps. Just calculate the number, think about the sign, perhaps afterwards. So if we do this calculation, we get minus 14.4 kJs. OK, and so then the grams canceled, the moles canceled. The key is that the delta H here is per two moles of H2O2 reacting to form two moles of water and a mole of O2. So that whatever the reaction is, we have to use the coefficients in that balanced reaction. So if we're told a reaction has a delta H, we have to see the reaction. We have to know how the reaction was balanced in order to relate that particular delta H to the particular reaction in the way that it's balanced. Because like I said, if you double all the coefficients, you would double delta H. If you cut the coefficients in half, we'd have to cut delta H in its magnitude in half here. But we get minus 14.4 kJs out here from this reaction. So then I can think of the negative sign, meaning that this reaction has a negative Q reaction, so the reaction's losing heat. Okay, So the reaction is going to release 14.4 kJs of heat to its surroundings. Okay, so most problems tend to ask for the heat absorbed or released. It would be kind of like, generally we maybe don't ask the question so often, like what's your money change if you go to the casino? Like see, that's a weird way to ask the question. What's your change in money if you go to the casino? You probably say, how much did you win or how much did you lose? And that's kind of like when you think of the heat gained or heat absorbed is what you're really thinking is, is you know, you could say the Q reaction. The question could say, what's the Q of the reaction? And the answer would be minus 14.4. Four kJs. But I think it's easier to think of did the reaction absorb heat or did it lose heat? Did you win money or lose money? So keep the sign of heat usually positive, just a matter of where is it going to and from. So the heat's going from the reaction to the surroundings. So if you were doing this reaction in water, the temperature of the surroundings should increase because it's getting the heat given off from this particular chemical reaction. So remember, we'll see this in the problems we'll be solving later today of the calorimetry problems that the Q of the reaction is always a negative of the Q of the surroundings. That this is just a fundamental relationship. The reaction's losing heat, the surroundings gaining it. If the reaction's absorbing heat, the surroundings is losing the heat to the reaction. It helps us hopefully try to keep track where's the heat coming from, where's it going to in the problem. OK, so section 5.4 deals with enthalpies of reaction. We've been talking about these problems um, in, in, in these bullet points here, so we'll just do a quick review. Delta H is extensive. What that means is if you have A goes to B, and you know delta H is, say, 25 kJs, if you double A, so you have 2A goes to 2B, then the delta H would double to 50. So that uh, delta H is an extensive property, depends on the quantity of A and B in the reaction. And so if you think of the delta H per mole, 
So think of it this way. So it's 25 kJs per one mole of A from my first reaction. And then for my second reaction, it would be 50 kJs, but now per two moles of A. So the ratio of heat change to moles is the same. So the kJs per mole works out to be equivalent when we think of using this delta H as a ratio. So the key is whenever you have, say, a reaction given like the second one here, that if we're going to use 50 kJs, it's per ratio of 2A forming 2B, and the 2 being 2 moles. So the coefficients here are assumed to be moles. Then obviously, if, if you flip the reaction, if you have B goes to A, we're keeping with this example, then the delta H would be negative 25 kJs. So you flip the sign. If you flip the reaction, and then if you had B and A, let's say these are gaseous particles, if you had B goes to A now as a liquid, that you should expect that reaction to have a different um, value for delta H. So delta H depends on the physical states of the substances, and that's because there's this enthalpy associated with going from solid to liquid to gas. So there's enthalpy change for substances to undergo melting and boiling. And we can understand and almost like review, just for any substance that's going from a solid to a liquid state that's undergoing a melting, or a liquid that's undergoing vaporization, can you consider what the delta H value should be for melting? Should it be positive or negative? What do you guys think? So the solid would have to absorb heat to melt. So it's not just going to melt spontaneously. It's going to have to absorb heat in order to melt. And that means that the A solids are going to have to absorb heat, and that would be an endothermic reaction. Same thing. Liquid vaporizing to a gaseous substance, the liquid has to absorb heat to break the forces that are binding the liquid molecules together. So delta H would be greater than zero for liquid to gas. And then obviously if you flip and have um, say the freezing of a liquid. So if you have a liquid freezing, then you know if you flip the reaction, you flip the sign, and you know if it's solid to liquid is positive, then liquid to solid should be the opposite sign and less than zero. You can also think of it this way, that the liquid has to give off the energy it has of its motion of its molecules. It has to lose that energy in order to freeze. and has to give that energy off to its surroundings. Okay, so you can consider the, uh, that the phase changes have a particular sign of delta H that you can imagine or consider just from a solid has to absorb heat to melt and then even more heat to vaporize um, and likewise the opposite for gas to liquid or liquid to solid. Now, calorimetry is a technique where we can go into the lab and use this technique to track the heat flow of substances so we maybe can calculate things like heat capacities, specific heats, um, or maybe even like delta H's of reaction. So we're going to start off with just kind of a consideration for different substances, specific heats. So a specific heat is shown here for like N2, but as a gas, aluminum as a gas, iron as a solid. Um, so the um, we also see here like water liquid. So water's uh, specific heat is 4.18. I wish I'd put this extra 4 here because it's exactly 4.184 joules per gram Kelvin. And that ends up being the conversion over to the calorie scale. So the, the scale of energy sometimes that you use is that one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. That's an exact conversion where the calorie is just sort of defined as the heat it takes to raise liquid water's heat by one degree C. So one gram of water by one degree C. So the specific heats are specifically for a substance to raise one gram of that substance by a degree C. Um, going up by a degree C is going up by a Kelvin. Can we agree on that? Like if we go from 25 to 26 degrees C, think about what that temperature difference would be in the Kelvin scale. Let's even do this precisely. Let me just, um, so let's say we have 25.00 degrees C going to 26.00 degrees C. What would that temperature difference be in the Kelvin scale? So we're just going up by one degree C. So if we convert to Kelvin, that's 273.15. So that would be 298.15 Kelvin would be 25 degrees C in Kelvin, right? 
And then 26 degrees C in Kelvin would be 299.15 Kelvin. So do you see how going up by a degree is the same magnitude of temperature increase as going up by a Kelvin? So a delta T of 1 degree C equals 1 Kelvin. So whenever that's a change in temperature, that works out. So obviously, a degree C doesn't equal a Kelvin. Two different temperature scales. But if you go up by a degree C or down by a degree C, that's the same magnitude of increase um, in the degree C and the Kelvin scale. OK. That, that'll help us see that sometimes we'll see specific heats given in joules per gram Kelvin. Sometimes joules per gram degree C, and those units are synonymous. So like you could say the specific heat of water is therefore also for water liquid, you could write that it must be 4.184 joules per gram degree C as well. So like joules per gram Kelvin, joules per gram degree C, equivalent units. So what a specific heat is relating to us versus a heat capacity, a specific heat is relating the Q change associated with a particular mass undergoing a particular change in temperature times whatever the specific heat is for the substance. So Q is equal to MCS delta T. So what this expression is describing is that if a um, substance like water is going to go up in temperature, then it has to absorb an appropriate amount of heat. So you'd have to take the quantity of water, 4.184 joules per gram degree C. So you could say, well, if you want to go up by 15 degrees C for water, you would, and you want to take, say, 150 grams of water, then you would just take that equal, the heat required to do that process would be 150 grams times 4.184 joules per gram degree C and then times the 15 degrees that you want to go up in temperature. So if you want to go up in temperature by 15 degrees, so say 25 to 40, maybe you want to go from 20 to 35, you're just going up 15 degrees in temperature, would take this quantity of heat to be absorbed by water. So the mass is canceling, the temperature is canceling, and you're calculating an energy unit and just the units of joules. You could also relate a heat capacity uh, maybe you have an object and not a substance. So if you have um, an object instead of a pure substance, you might describe the heat capacity um, through a single unit. So you might have like a C cal. I would just call that the heat capacity times the delta T. So this works whenever we have an object as opposed to a pure substance. This will come up later. So when we get to, it probably won't come up until uh, um, Wednesday's lecture. When we solve a problem, like the bomb calorimetry problem, we'll, we'll discuss how the bomb calorimeter itself is kind of one single object and is often described as having a single heat capacity term. But we'll see that problem when we get to it a little bit later within this particular section. So one of the things that we see is different substances have different specific heats. So specific heats are specific to a substance, specific to a physical state as well. And then um, you can even compare a little bit, like say iron, Notice how the specific heat of iron is lower. What does that mean for iron? Well, if you have a cast iron skillet that has, say, an approximate mass that's the same as a pot of water, the water is going to have to absorb more heat to heat up. So you put the cast iron skillet on the stove. It heats up in like 30 seconds to a minute. It's red hot, ready to go. You put the same mass but of water in a pot and heat it up, it's going to take a lot longer to boil. It's going to take a lot longer to become um, not even as hot as that iron is getting. So it's going to take water more time because it's going to have to absorb more heat in order to warm up. Okay, now some types of problems that you can answer with this or address with this are that if you have, say, a hot piece of iron, let's say iron's at 100 degrees C, you add it to 100 grams of water. So you just have 10 grams of iron. And we, we know that iron has that smaller heat capacity, so it may have taken iron less heat to, to heat up, but it's also going like, to give less heat off as it cools down. So you put this hot piece of iron into um, 10 times the amount of water, so we have 100 grams of water at 25 degrees C in an isolated system. So you might be thinking, OK, if we put, um, if we put a lot, if we put 10 grams of iron into 100 grams of water, the iron's hot. The water's not. Is the water going to go up by a lot or just by a little? Probably just by a little, because the iron doesn't have as much heat to give off, because it didn't have to absorb that much heat in order to warm up in the first place. 
So we're doing this in an isolated system. This just means we're not going to lose heat to the surroundings. So imagine all the heat that iron has to lose goes into this water that it's being placed into. What is the final temperature of the water and the iron once they thermally equilibrate? That just simply means once they arrive at having the same temperature. Um, and so then you can use the specific heats. I'll just note them here that the CS is from the chart 0.45 joules per gram degree C or Kelvin. And then water, the CS was the 4.184 joules per gram degree C. And then the last thing I'll point out before I kind of like give you guys a chance to try to solve this problem is that what we're kind of doing here is relating the heat of iron to the heat of water. How are they related to each other? Like iron's losing heat in this particular problem because it's cooling down. Water should be warming up because it's accepting the heat being given off by the iron. So our relationship here, it turns out I, I can put the negative sign wherever I want to put it. So putting the negative sign in front of iron's Q or water's Q means mathematically the exact same. Because we're just saying that the heat of the one is the opposite of the heat change of the other. So all the heat lost by iron is being gained by water in this particular example. Now by putting the minus sign in front of water doesn't imply that the Q of water is negative. It just implies that whatever the heat change of water is, it's the negative of the sign of that of iron. Okay, so iron should be losing heat. Think of iron here, it should be dropping in heat. And the Q of water should be gaining the heat. But again, we're just going to put a minus sign in. And then we can use the minus sign and track and maybe just use our Q from our specific heats and use the MCS delta T for iron equal to the negative MCS delta T for water. And then the last thing I might point out is that delta T is just, of course, the final temperature minus the initial. So water and iron here have different initial temperatures, but they should end at the exact same final temperature as each other. So they start at different TIs. Iron starts at 100, water starts at 25, but they end at exactly the same TF. That's when they equilibrate with each other, when they have the same final temperature. OK, a little bit algebraically tricky, but see if you can set up the problem, either solve it algebraically, look at the choices, find a way to figure out which of the choices is the correct answer. I'll give you guys a few minutes to work on this one.
All right, one more minute, guys. Good, good job. Um, okay, so that's the right answer. Now let's discuss this for a moment. One is that there's two answers we could have rejected right off the bat without even doing any arithmetic. And if we reject the two answers, we at least if we make a math error, we can probably realize what that mistake is and then um, more easily catch it. And that is A and C. The reason why A and C would be impossible, if you have water at 25 and you're adding something hot to it, you can't drop in temperature. So we could not drop the temperature by adding the hot object to the cool water. The, if you were confused by the word isolated system, an isolated system is one that's not exchanging mass or energy with its surroundings. So it means that all the energy is being given off by the iron and it's containing and staying in the water. So none of it's being lost to the surroundings of this particular reaction. Now answer E I think is kind of like unlikely. I think it just looks a little too big. So you might be kind of weary that E was right if you were just like gauging the choices. So uh, because we're at a point where you could have just plugged in your two TFs or maybe three that you've narrowed down to and see which one kind of is closest to the right answer or solve the algebra. You know, because it's just a relatively trick algebra problem where we have to do some factoring. Um, if you want to see what it simplified down to, I had 4.5 TF minus 450 degrees C equals um, minus 418.4 TF minus 1,460. And so then that's just by factoring the two terms into the parentheses and then solving or getting us closer to being able to solve for TF. So if the algebra is getting you here, it is just algebra, but there's shortcuts around the algebra on a test that that is something that you're getting caught up by. So just think if this is a test question, figure out a way to get the right answer. No matter how you got to do it, I'm sure you can figure out a way, whether you solve for TF directly or using some um, exam approach. Oh, yes, that is right. That is, I just wrote that down wrong. So yes, the second term is positive because we have the minus sign out in front. And that is the easy sign to miss here. The Q irons, negative Q water. So we gotta have that minus sign here. So we end up minus on the TF and then minus with the minus with the plus. Thanks for pointing out uh, 1046. And so then we're just doing some rearranging, adding 450 to both sides, uh, adding 418.4 TF to both sides and then solving for TF if you're solving it this particular way. And so that works out to the 25.80 um, answer. Okay, so let's move on from this particular topic because what this um, example is really useful for is then seeing, well, what if instead of like hot iron, you put in a reaction in a container and then you just track the temperature of the container and then study what we call calorimetry. So constant pressure calorimetry is just accomplished by having an insulated cup. So maybe picture a coffee cup and a coffee cup. So the idea is here just have an insulated cup so all the heat stays within the reaction so that there's minimal heat being absorbed in from the surroundings, minimal heat getting out to the surroundings, so that the only real surroundings of this reaction is the water in the cup. So the water in the cup is your surroundings. So if the, the water of, uh, that, that, that you're checking the temperature of goes up, exothermic reaction. If it goes down, endothermic reaction. So same idea we've been talking about all of class, is that the water here is your true surroundings of the reaction. And that's what you track the temperature of. So in this technique here, we're tracking the temperature of the surroundings. And again, if the surrounding temperature goes up, the reaction lost heat. That's why it would go up. If the temperature of the surroundings, the water, the solution that we're monitoring the temperature of goes down, 
then that's because we have the, uh, the endothermic reaction absorbing the heat from that particular uh, solution. So all we need here is maybe a stirring motor, a thermometer, and then we have one of these coffee cup calorimeters. Um, and then let's see how we might find a problem given to us. So let's say we take a compound, ammonium nitrite, NH4NO2. Um, I did get a couple questions lately if midterm two is cumulative. It is not, so we're not going to ask you naming questions. If you need a formula, we'll give it to you. Um, we're not going to test you directly on chapter one through three topics again on midterm two. You will be tested on those topics again for the final, but we'll talk about reviewing and stuff like that when we get further along into the semester. So the next midterm, just chapter four through six, we're not going to throw you a name and expect you to remember nomenclature per se, even though I think you should. Uh, but if you missed a question, it's because you don't get the name, not because you missed something out of chapter four. We just want to test you on um, chapters four through six. So ammonium nitrate added to water inside of a coffee cup calorimeter. Uh, so a coffee cup calorimeter is just the key word for a constant pressure form of calorimeter. You have two grams of the compound, 50 grams of water, and then the temperature is being lowered. So it's going from 25 to 22.24 degrees C. What is the enthalpy of solution in units of kJs per mole of ammonium nitrite? So the two steps we're gonna think here is that from this one example, we can see for this amount of two grams of ammonium nitrite going into the solution, what is like the joule or the kJ joule, um, the, the joules or the kilojoules being changed for this particular problem when that's dissolving into the solution? Then after that, we might think, well, how much does that heat relate to the particular quantity um, that had undergone the reaction? Because usually what we wanna find here is some property of a substance in units of like kJs per mole or maybe in units of, uh, of reaction. So if this were thought of, if we're thinking this is a reaction, we have ammonium nitrite dissolving in the water, we know it should ionize to ammonium and nitrite ion. We know that much from chapter four. And so now from this particular problem, what we might be able to work out is that the temperature of the reaction, or, or excuse me, the, the heat of the reaction, the Q reaction is always the negative Q of the surroundings. The surroundings here are the calorimeter and the contents of the calorimeter. Uh, and the calorimeter contents are that solution. So we can, we can sort of say that the surroundings are just whatever that solution is that the reaction's occurring in. And so maybe you can write negative Q of the solution is the um, equal to the heat of the reaction. So the Q of the reaction is the negative of the heat change of the solution. Uh, bless you. The solution is mostly water. It's mostly described by it, it being water, but we might write that our Q solution is just defined by the MCS delta T, but of the solution. So what's the mass of the solution here? Is it two, is it 50, or is it 52? Well, we use the whole solution. The solution's everything. So the M solution would be 52 grams. 52.0 grams. The CS, we're told to assume it's that of water. So CS is often probably not exactly that of water, but we're often told to assume it's just whatever water CS is, which is 4.184 joules per gram degree C. And then the delta T we can calculate, because it's just a TF minus a TI. Okay. Before I calculate delta T, is this reaction exothermic or endothermic? And then how do you know that? This is like the most crucial part, because we can eliminate some answers if we get this right at this point. Is it exo or is it endo? It is endothermic. It's endothermic because the reaction must be absorbing heat because the solution is losing the heat. Okay, the solution's temperature is dropping. Remember, you're not tracking the temperature of the reaction, it's always the surroundings that you're tracking the temperature of. So the water surrounding this react reaction um, has lost some of its heat because it was taken by the reaction because it's endothermic. Should I have a positive delta H? So delta H of this solution process should be greater than zero. So I can already eliminate two of my choices. Okay, now our TF minus our TI, uh, final temperature 22.24 minus 25.0, um, zero. And then we can calculate our Q solution. Now remember the Q reaction is the negative of that change. So the solution, the Q of the solution, 
the solution's losing heat because it's dropping in temperature because the reaction is absorbing that heat. So this all works out to be a negative quantity. Let me work that out real quick. We won't throw this to you in top hat since we're getting close to the end of class. We'll go 52 times 4.184 times the quantity of the temperature difference. So that would be 2.76 and negative. So that comes out to be negative 600.5 joules. Okay, now why is the answer not minus 600? Or why is it not even plus 600? Or a Q reaction is a negative of this. So the Q reaction would be positive. Um, but then what you have to consider is, well, what is the reaction that's actually occurring? It's not the reaction of a whole mole. It's only the reaction of two grams of the ammonium nitrite dissolving. So if we want to calculate the delta H in units of kJs, because that's what we're asking the problem, kJs per mole, we have to take the plus 600 kJs, or 600 Js, it's not even in kJs yet, take the 600 joules, that that's the ratio of heat for two grams of the ammonium nitrite that's reacting. And we just gotta do a gram to mole conversion. All we gotta do is multiply by the number of grams per mole of ammonium nitrite. And then maybe convert over to kJs, 1,000 joules in a kJ. So we go from joules per gram, grams to moles, we get the delta H for the solution process in units of kJs per mole. We've eliminated the answer down to two choices. We know now it's not 600, so the answer has to be C. So you can plug the math in and solve for it if you wish later. But it should work out to be answer C here. So that's uh, an example of a coffee cup calorimetry problem. We'll see another example next time of a slightly different form of calorimetry. All right, guys, that's all for today. Have a great afternoon.